Good evening. I am Bill Doley. I'm president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and this is our first uh, session of our Archaeology Cafe series up here in Changing Hands Bookstore. So, so Archaeology Southwest is a private nonprofit organization. We're based in Tucson. We work all across the uh, U.S. Southwest. We try to share the information of the Mexican Northwest as well. And our primary, we do what we call preservation archaeology. And that has a strong research component. It has a site protection program. We actually own a number of uh, 20 different properties we either own or have conservation easements on across the Southwest. And we do a lot related to public outreach. And our Archaeology Southwest magazine is a really, really important component of that. So for all of you who are members, this issue on Phoenix Underground is in the mail to you. It's a 52-page uh, story of what on the surface is a very young city. Um, however, below that ground surface, Phoenix Underground has a really deep history. And that's the story that we try to tell in this, these 52 pages. We've tried to put out a story that you can follow um, quite well, and we've made this the theme of our Archaeology Cafe series here in, in Phoenix uh, this season. This is season number six for Phoenix. We've done this for 10 years down in Tucson. Tucson, this year, we have that theme of Tucson Underground. So in 2010, our magazine issue did a Tucson Underground issue. A couple years back, we did Santa Fe Underground, and now, <coughs> hot off the press, is Phoenix Underground. So all of these Southwest his cities have amazing histories. So Todd Bostwick, um, I've known Todd a long time. Uh, you, many of you probably have known Todd. He was, the, uh, I think, the, the most um, relevant to what we're doing here tonight. Uh, important thing in, in his life was he was the city archaeologist based there at, at Pueblo Grande Museum. And he's done an incredible amount to make the city of Tucson, of Phoenix, sorry, don't say that. Uh, city of Phoenix um, pay attention to its past through his public outreach, through his research, through his uh, commitment to um, to making those concerns about development uh, address archaeology uh, prior to, to construction projects. So Todd is a uh, retiree now, and it, which means, like most retirees, he works double hard uh, from what he used to do. Uh, very active with the Verde Valley Archaeological Society, uh, published books on rock art, and he's going to talk to us tonight about some of the history of archaeology here in the Phoenix area, looking at what the Phoenix freeway system and other roads in the area uh, have to say about the archaeology of this amazing place. So without further ado, Todd Bostwick. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Bill, for that nice introduction. Thank you for coming out tonight. Appreciate your support. Uh, Archaeology Southwest is really a remarkable organization, and I'm proud to uh, participate in their programs and to uh, be involved in all the wonderful things that they do. Uh, I was asked to talk tonight about some archaeology that occurred under freeways that you drive on, probably drove on to get here, and so, and also to keep it not too technical because it's going to be a general audience. So. Those archaeologists I see in here, I apologize in advance to you, but uh, there's a lot of information that has been uncovered about the ancient culture that lived in uh, the Salt River Valley, the Hohokam, uh, when the freeways were built. And fortunately, uh, in the 1970s and the 19, early 1980s, the federal government and the state government strengthened the laws that require archaeological investigations be done before freeways were built. And the timing couldn't have been better because in the uh, 1980s and early 1990s was when, 
Okay, I just advanced the slide and it didn't advance on the screen. That's not difficult for an archaeologist, by the way, to keep talking because uh, we, we're yes. very good at that. So as I was saying, fortunately the timing uh, was really good that the laws were strengthened requiring archaeological for federal and state projects because it was in the 1980s and the early 1990s that many parts of our current freeway system were built. And so uh, there was a lot of archaeological work done, a uh, large number of graduate students, uh, got to experience the Hocom culture through their uh, participation in the work that was done. And it really set uh, our knowledge of the Hocom uh, greatly forward. And uh, so what I'm going to do tonight is just pick a few interesting tidbits of some of those projects and talk about them in a general way and then talk about some of the what things that I thought were interesting and in a way to sort of explain uh, what we know about the Hocom culture. That's not good when she's shaking her head like that. <laughs> well, I can tell you that uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about six archeological projects uh, that were undertaken at Hocom villages, all of which were very important villages. And it will be uh, Interstate 10, uh, State Route 51, uh, State Route 143. And all three of those are uh, sizable freeways and the projects that were undertaken were very large. In fact, some of them, are, it's going to surprise you how large these archaeological investigations were. Yes, and so all the projects that I'm going to talk about, I was involved with or knew about in some capacity. Now, when I was putting this together, there were some uh, challenges that I thought about. First of all, you should know that uh, since 1990, there's been a law, a state law, as well as federal laws, that require that we show the ultimate respect for the dead. And so we've actually, uh, archaeologists have actually excavated thousands of Hocom individuals in our projects. And all of those individuals have been what we call repatriated. And so they've been uh, studied and then uh, uh, reburied uh, in cemeteries, uh, primarily on the Salt River Pima Maricopa community reservation. And they've requested that we not show any photographs of artifacts that were found in burials. So in my presentation today, you won't see any photographs of artifacts found in burials. Fortunately, we are allowed to show illustrations of the artifacts. So I will focus on illustrations. And in fact, everything pretty much that I'm going to talk about today came from the reports that got written because the uh, requirements of archaeology involve not only excavation and removal of the materials, but their study and their analysis and the curation of the materials that are not burial goods, and then the writing of reports. And so while the materials, you may or may not see them in a museum or have the opportunity to uh, uh, Spider-Man, <laughs> yes. I didn't realize this was going to be a comedy uh, <laughs> performance tonight. Todd, is that you up there? <laughs> yeah. And so the reports are actually really, really important part of archaeological investigation. In fact, there was a famous archaeologist, Jesse Jennings, who once said, if it's not written up, it didn't happen. Because unfortunately, in the past, there's been a lot of archaeological excavations that uh, good work has been done, but a report is never written. And so even other archaeologists never really learn uh, about what was found, uh, what was learned, uh, what new knowledge was gained. Uh, so to me, the reports are really a critical part of the archaeology process. And fortunately, all of the projects I'm going to talk about tonight, there were really outstanding reports that were written. And they are available. They're in the libraries. Uh, they may be in special collections. But uh, for most part, they are available to just about anybody that wants to uh, study the reports and, and learn in great detail. In fact, I go back and sometimes reread these reports and say, wow, I forgot all about this really unbelievable knowledge that we learned from these excavations. So uh, you'll see that most of my talk today will be based on the actual reports. 
And I'll throw a few things in of my ideas as well that are a little maybe over the top just for the fun of it. Uh, uh, but, but I really uh, need to thank all those archaeologists that have done the work and that have uh, spent the time uh, often uh, volunteering because even though we are paid, uh, not well paid, uh, many times uh, we put many, many extra hours in and there's a lot of work that's done essentially for free because we love archaeology. Uh, most archaeologists I know, in fact, almost all of them are highly passionate about the subject matter. And <laughs> hey, all right, thank, thank you very much. That's OK. All right. Been resolved. So I've given you a little prelude as to what uh, what my goal was, and uh, my gratitude towards all the archaeologists. Some of them are actually in the crowd today, uh, and their contributions. And so uh, you can see the freeway system here: uh, Interstate 10, inter uh, State Route 51, State Route 143 are the ones I'm going to talk about because they're in the city of Phoenix and. That was my mission to talk about archaeology under the freeways of Phoenix. Uh, in that issue that came out, if you want to see what I have to say about Holcomb Platform Mounds, I wrote the article in there about Pueblo Grande and Mesa Grande, uh, but I won't talk too much about platform mounds today. Now, the, uh, so I assume this is going to work. Whoops. Yay. All right. The, whole, the culture that uh, occupied uh, all of the Salt River Valley, and as well as a large portion of southern Arizona, is called the Hohokam. Uh, that's an archaeological term, uh, but it is uh, a term that applies to the archaeological materials that we write up. The Pima-speaking Atam call it the Hugam, so it's kind of similar to the term that they used for the people of the past. And the more we learn about these people, the more we are really amazed because uh, they occupied this part of the West for almost a thousand years. And it, that's a remarkable accomplishment if you think about it. In the arid desert, there was one culture that was sustainable through the use of the manipulation of water because they were irrigators, they farmed the land. Uh, through irrigation canals, and they had a sustained lifestyle for around a thousand years. There's actually very few other cultures in the world that you can say that about. And even the Egyptians, I like to point out, have three major periods, and each one only lasted about 500 years. So it's, it's, it's an example of, of a culture that understood the environment that they lived in, they knew how to utilize the resources. They had an intimate knowledge of the landscape. And uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Emil Howery, one of the uh, well-known and famous Hokom archaeologists said, uh, they effectively blended their technological know-how with the resources that nature made available to them. And their subsistence was really uh, quite impressive because not only did they farm thousands of acres of land, it's been estimated that uh, at least 70,000 acres of land in the Phoenix area were under cultivation, uh, you know, from about 600 AD till 1400, uh, and that the irrigation systems uh, supported those farms of corn, beans, and squash, and also cotton, a major cotton industry. And so the historic cotton industry that's so well known in Arizona actually began with the Hohokam, much like most of the canals. In fact, uh, it's been said that uh, at least 10 or 12 or even 14 of the historic canals that established Phoenix as an early historic settlement were built in or next to Hohokam canals. And so uh, they, they understood the landscape and they utilized it to an incredible extent. And in addition to the farmland, they also utilized many natural resources as well. Uh, just a few that I'll talk about. Uh, here's a, a map that I put together. It shows the Phoenix area and some of the major Hocom villages. And uh, the blue are uh, major canals. Uh, it's been estimated that the Hocom uh, 
constructed more than 1,000 miles of canals. Uh, and you think about that, that was without any draft animals, that's without uh, any metal tools, and that's uh, without any sophisticated equipment. It's all by hand. Of course, they were surveyed because they had to be uh, at grade because they're all at gravity uh, level. They, uh, and they had to be maintained and rebuilt and re-engineered. But it really was engineering uh, that they, they, they uh, utilized your engineering skills. <coughs> and the focus of my talk today is going to be on Canal System 2, which is the whole area here of all those villages. And I'm going to talk about first Pueblo Grande, a large project that was undertaken there. Uh, then I'll talk about La Ciudad and Grand Canal Ruins, and then Casa Buena, and then I'll just finish uh, briefly with uh, Las Colinas. Uh, Las Colinas is actually one of the uh, lesser known sites because only a small portion of it was excavated uh, for Interstate 10 uh, interchange. Uh, but it's, it was an important uh, site and very large site, although I suspect it probably was more than one site. Um, and so those are the sites I'm going to focus on today. All of them were done for freeway projects. And of course, hundreds of archaeological sites have been excavated. Um, but these are the freeway projects that I think have made major contributions to our understanding of the Hocom. The uh, first one is uh, the Hocom Expressway, or State Route 143. And it cut right through the heart of Pueblo Grande, which is a National Historic Landmark, which contains uh, one of the best preserved platform mounds and also uh, canals. Uh, in the Parker for Waters area of it. And uh, although the portion that the city owns, which is a, a preserve and a museum, uh, is a great place to go uh, learn about the whole com, by the way, if you haven't been there, uh, there was a large part of the site that was private property. And when ADOT uh, purchased that property and built the state highway through there, uh, there was a huge excavation project that was undertaken. Uh, from 1988 to 1990. And when I say huge, uh, I mean huge. Uh, $3.75 million was spent on archaeology for that freeway. If you can imagine that. Uh, 45 different people worked on the crew uh, for a period of almost a year and a half straight. Uh, it's one of the largest archaeological projects ever undertaken in the Southwest, certainly in Phoenix. Uh, and what uh, the people that worked on it like to point out is that there were 142 days that were over 100 degrees that they were out there excavating. I like to remind people that in Phoenix, we don't stop just because it gets hot. I can remember days coming back from a dig and the temperature sign said 113 degrees. Uh, and again, it's the, the, uh, a testament to the hard work of the archaeologists that are doing uh, these excavations. <coughs> now. The Pueblo Grande excavations for State Route 143 involved uh, examining 17 cemeteries and 14 habitation areas, which is a large uh, example of the, of the site itself. Uh, and that included uh, over 836 burials. And you can learn a lot about a people by examining the burials. I'm not going to focus on the burials of this site. I'll talk about that in another site. But the work that was done on those burials was quite phenomenal and uh, provided a lot of information. But also the uh, other archaeological features, as we call them, there were uh, over 1,800 pits that were excavated. And those pits were for preparation of food, for storage, for extracting and mixing caliche, and also for trash pits. And um, over 500,000 shirts, 500,000 shirts were washed uh, with a sample of those uh, examined. Really a huge effort. And in fact, uh, much to my delight, they wrote, archaeologists wrote over 2,000 pages of reports for that day alone. So if you want to get started, there's a good one. In a couple of years, you, you'll be finished uh, understanding it. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a permanent record what the archaeologists did. Now, um, the uh, studies that were done, like many of the freeway studies, 
really provided a lot of information about how the Hokam organized themselves, uh, not just what they ate and, and how they survived, but, but how they uh, uh, actually had rules about society. And some of those rules involve what I would call town planning, uh, uh, rules about uh, how people uh, organize themselves within a village, how the villages were organized, how villages organ uh, interacted with other villages. And we now understand the Hokam to such a degree that we can say a lot about uh, what they did, um, but there's still some questions that remain uh, despite all the work uh, that was done. Uh, but the, uh, it was very clear here and as, as well as other studies that the uh, organized uh, rules uh, created sort of a template where you have a cluster of houses and then you have trash mounds associated with those cluster of houses. Then you have cemeteries that are associated with the uh, trash mounds and the houses and also cooking features. And so you really begin to see that the whole com, one of the ways that they were so sustainable is that they had rules and people followed the rules. It was a very organized and orderly society. Uh, there was a lot of houses that got excavated, and for, in fact, almost 350 houses were, were dug for this project. Uh, there were a lot of uh, different kinds of houses. Uh, in the Holcomb Society, we, we have four periods, uh, pioneer, colonial, sedentary, and classic, and I, I won't bore you with those, but I will just say that uh, for the first three periods, uh, from about AD 500 or earlier, uh, the Hokam um, essentially had a similar culture up until what we call the Classic Period, around AD 1100 to 1150. At that time, there were major changes that occurred in Hokam culture. In fact, changes that we're still trying to understand why. Different kinds of architecture, different ways to organize yourself, different ways to bury uh, your dead. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is the Classic Period because it just so happened that a lot of the work done on the freeways was in uh, classic period uh, parts of the sites. But the pit houses uh, were uh, an early component of the Hokam, and they went right up until the classic period and then continued to be built. So even when there were great changes, when they were building apartment complexes with above ground adobe structures, they still continued to, to build pit houses. So uh, there's clearly some traditionalists that say, yes, the new way is interesting, but I'm not doing the new way. And so that, that, again, creates challenges to understand what's going on in Hokam society. And I think there's many analogies uh, with our own society, too, about fashion and, and tradition. And uh, here's just an example of uh, a courtyard group, uh, simplified, but does give you an idea that uh, you can see often they were oriented towards a courtyard area and that that was probably an extended family group and those extended families uh, then uh, were, had larger units that made up the segments of villages. Uh, one of the things of the Pueblo Grande excavation is they found that uh, there was a transition from the pit houses to uh, combination of pit houses and adobe structures and then uh, adobe structures. And so uh, now we say at the sedentary period, the last part of the pre-classic and then the classic period, there's at least seven to nine different kinds of architectural uh, styles. It's very confusing, uh, but very interesting. Here you see now you have a pit house that's got adobe walls with post reinforced uh, components. And then uh, one of the habitation areas, the 14 habitation areas I talked about, you can see that here's the large trash mound, and then you have all these uh, pit houses, uh, and it's our job to sort them out which are courtyard groups and which are not. and uh, and to tease out the information of how they're organized. And you can see, of course, uh, it gets confusing, but you also see that there are uh, always burials associated with the habitation areas. And then later in the classic period, the uh, predominant uh, domestic structures were compounds. Uh, they're very insular, where there were walls that surrounded the rooms. There were also adobe uh, rooms that were inside the compounds and outside the compounds, again with some burials inside and some in cemeteries. Uh, but it is an entirely different kind of architectural style. And why, after many, many centuries, they changed their architectural styles uh, is a good question. Uh, 
It could be influence from the South, uh, where a lot of influence was always going on. The Mesoamerican cultures uh, were clearly uh, in contact and providing new ideas, innovative approaches. Okay, so you have all this architecture. Well, all we uh, find as an archaeologist is the floors and the lower walls, but of course, uh, they were uh, had superstructures, and sometimes we find the wood. But the question is, well, how did they uh, uh, get the wood? They didn't go to the lumber yard and say, I'd like so many uh, pieces of two by four and plywood. They had to cut it themselves. And so they figured out that uh, made out of hard cobbles, they could create these stone axes, or three quarter groove. They would have been happy, and they're remarkably effective in chopping down the hard desert woods because the Hocom utilized every wood source available. And there's a lot of species of wood in, in the Sonoran Desert. But of course, the best is mesquite, because it's hard, it preserves well, uh, but it does have to be shaped, and you, you need to do heavy-duty chopping. And so at most Holcomb sites, you do find these, these stone axes that were an essential part of their uh, equipment to, to be able to produce the large amount of wood that was required to build these uh, structures. And then a really important tool also that we typically find are what we call tabular knives. These are very thin. Uh, Phyllite or slate, uh, large knives, uh, bigger than a person's hand, uh, that were used for cutting plants, they're cutting tools, and especially for cutting agave. And agave is, it seems like a, just a common plant. Uh, it's a succulent with the sharp spikes on it. Many of you probably have them in your backyard. I know I do. But agave was probably one of the most important plants the Hocom uh, had. The reason being is because not only can you eat the heart, it's delicious and nutritious, but the leaves, when you process them, they create fibers. Those fibers, you can make ropes and nets and bags that are really strong and that are you know, the mainstay of, of uh, the, the ties that you have to have uh, in all the different activities that you're involved with. And so the agave was an extremely important plant but it's, it's very hard to process, and so the processing involved these specialized tools that we typically find, uh, sometimes with serrated edges, sometimes with, uh, with uh, different uh, uh, kinds of uh, shapes and forms, sometimes hafted even, uh, and they've been suggested they might even have been hose, and, and some were, I suppose. Uh, but uh, it is interesting that it was a specialized tool that the whole comet developed and used for you know as, as much as a thousand years. Now. There were a lot of vessels, as you can imagine, because of all the burials that were dug. Uh, and in fact, uh, they uh, recovered more than 2,000 whole pots at the Pueblo Grande project. Uh, that's quite a uh, load of information. Uh, here's some illustrations of them. Uh, they're red on buff, which is the hallmark of the Hocom culture, although they also made a redware and a plainware. And the uh, Red on buff designs uh, were elaborate for the classic period, but were actually uh, not as elaborate as earlier uh, styles uh, before the classic period. Uh, but it, this project uh, provided an opportunity to learn a lot about the, uh, the ceramics. In fact, some of the major advances on uh, understanding uh, ceramic production and trade came out of this project. It's the work that David Abbott did showed that uh, most pots were not even made at Pueblo Grande. They were made elsewhere and then traded in by other Hocom people, which is really a revolution in understanding pottery because we always thought that every village made their own pottery. But it's not true. It's much more complex. There's probably at least five or six or seven different sources uh, that we've been able to determine by the temper that's in the clay uh, that makes the clay stronger when it's fired, uh, indicating uh, different areas that people were making pottery and then were being traded into villages like Pueblo Grande. It's, uh, it's really made us open our eyes up about how they're organizing themselves across the landscape because we can see trade partners. Also, we found that the polished redware was a preferred vessel for burials. It was a beautiful red uh, ware. And then the plainware um, uh, seemed to come primarily from Canal System 2, which reinforced the idea that people that were living on the same canal system were interacting together. And so your neighbor was part of your trade process and probably you were sharing in the construction and maintenance of the canal system, and that's reflected in the planeware ceramics. Uh, there's also polychromes. Uh, most of them were probably traded in from long distances. Some were locals, but uh, 
the, uh, the polychrome uh, was often uh, uh, made by other cultures, as well as black and white, which is not a Hokam style. And uh, more than 50 different types of imported ceramics were found at Pueblo Grande from all different directions. Again, showing a vast trade network that just one Hokam site was involved with. Now, of course, it's Pueblo Grande. It's a very important site. It's at the head gate of this massive canal system. But nonetheless, it reflects that the Hokam did not live alone. They were traded, interacting, intermarrying with a large network of other cultures as well as other Hokam people. Including the Hopi, we find Hopi yellowware. So ancestral Hopi were trading with the Hokam, uh, and so were the people from Prescott and as well as the lower Colorado River. Uh, there were some unusual finds of Pueblo Grande. Ceramic uh, dogs were found on just one floor. There were uh, actually uh, six of them uh, and a fifth one without a head. Five of them are painted. Uh, they're pretty large. They're about seven or eight inches. And there's two other sites that have found, found these caches of ceramic dogs. We know that the Hokam domesticated the dog. It's the only domesticated animal that they had. And in fact, there were uh, bones from uh, at least five dogs, maybe as many as 15 dogs. Sometimes it's hard to tell coyote bone from a dog bone. But clearly, the Hokam had dogs at Pueblo Grande as well as other sites. And uh, it's interesting that we're finding these ceramic uh, effigy, vessel, uh, effigy uh, items. And uh, it's been suggested that the dogs may be related to merchants. Uh, may have been something to represent merchants that were traders uh, because the context and some ethnographic examples suggest that. It's an open question, but it's, a, it's an unusual find. And uh, it's very interesting. All of them have open mouths, by the way, which to me suggests it's a barking dog. It's the only kind of dog I know uh, is a barking dog. So. Uh, but you keep in mind, dogs are great uh, because they see at night. They'd be a great thing to uh, warn you of uh, you know, people coming at night. And also, they're good uh, to help hunters, too. So they would have been very valuable members of the community. And I'm aware of where there's even been children that have been buried, and the dog is buried with the child. So there's association. Also, there's a red on buff effigy found of a bighorn sheep. Uh, and we know the Hokam were great hunters because uh, we find their projectile points, which of course would be also used for warfare. Uh, but what's interesting is of the thousands and thousands of bones from Pueblo Grande, uh, what do they find they're eating is rabbits, uh, especially in the classic period, which could well be because they had hunted all the big game out. I mean, when you live in the same place for 700,000 years, uh, you know, the big game gets hunted. and so. Of the thousands and thousands of bones, they could only reconstruct three deer and one mountain bighorn sheep at Pueblo Grande in, the, in this excavation. Uh, but lots of rabbits and fish. And uh, of course, because the fish would have been obtained from the Salt River. And what are the fish but chub and suckers, uh, which are, of course, uh, meaty, but not very tasty if you've ever eaten a sucker. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a protein source. What's interesting, though, is before the classic period, there was very few fish that we find in Hokam sites. So it could well be that during the classic period, protein was a, was a challenge to get enough protein in the diet. And so they started adding fish to the diet so that they could uh, you know, supplement the corn, beans, and squash. And uh, the largest uh, collection of fish bones from any Hokam site is actually from Pueblo Grande uh, that I'm aware of. Of course, the whole com loved to decorate themselves. And uh, we don't know. They probably had tattoos. They probably painted themselves up. But we do find a lot of jewelry. Uh, and the jewelry is often of uh, zoomorphic figures, uh, lizards and birds in particular, and also sh uh, frogs. And uh, some of us have argued that those are probably ritual animals that are associated with the desert, and it's particular with water. And the lizard, of course, is a. Uh, an animal of the underground, and the bird is of the upper ground, uh, the sky. And so you actually have uh, both universes represented. And, and of course, the shell uh, frogs are clearly associated with water. So it's possible that the jewelry was just not decorative, but it actually may have had meaning, uh, both ritually, and then also it might have represented some kind of status to the person that wore it. Uh, we don't know, but we, we have interesting ideas about that. And of course, the vast majority of the cell came from 
Rocky Point. So I, I like to kid that, uh, you know, the Ro Holcom have been vacationing in Rocky Point well before we ever got the idea uh, to do that. And, uh, but there's also shell from the Pacific Coast as well. Uh, and clay and stone spindle whorls, and this is how they spun the cotton that they grew. In fact, it's well known now that the Holcom controlled the cotton industry for most of the Southwest up until about AD 1000. Uh, because the, the species of cotton that are known for the Holcom uh, were not adapted to cold climates. Uh, as you probably know, cotton loves warm climate and lots of water, and that was perfect for the Holcom because of their canal systems and the, and the warm summers. And so uh, a lot of the northern cultures that were providing those ceramic vessels may well have been trading it for cotton that the Hokam were so successfully growing. Uh, we do find uh, Hokam vessels up there, but not many. And that's because in the scheme of things, Hokam pottery was not very good. Uh, the clays are not good. It doesn't fire real well. It breaks real easy. Uh, the northern ceramics are so much better quality. And so it clearly was something else that was being traded. It was probably cotton and also surplus corn, because when you're talking about tens of thousands of acres of corn, uh, there's going to be surplus. Uh, so uh, that probably was another trade item. OK, so that's just a little bit about Pueblo Grande. Now let's talk about uh, La Ciudad. Uh, and that was actually directed by Glenn Rice, who's right here, and also Kathy Henderson, who's here. And uh, that was a very important project uh, for an interchange uh, at uh, Interstate 10, uh, just north of St. Luke Hospital. And in many ways, it was kind of innovative because uh, there were new discoveries there that made us really start thinking about how sophisticated HOCOM social organization was, uh, how the courtyard groups were organized, and um, uh, there was a ball court there that was excavated, uh, and the ball courts, which came from Mesoamerica, we know probably served as integrative devices, uh, likely where marketplaces uh, were held, where trade goods, such as those ceramics and the cotton and other materials, were exchanged. And uh, that's, they served an important role. But of course, uh, the ball courts, for some reason, uh, drop out around 11 or 1,200. And then that's when the platform mounds <laughs> seem to have taken their place. So that's one of those interesting changes that we don't quite understand why it took place. But uh, La Ciudad, uh, that was excavated uh, by Glenn and Kathy, uh, was primarily an earlier component, a pre-classic component. So it provided a lot of information about the courtyard arrangements of the houses. And what I think is really fascinating was for some irrigation features that were found there. It's one of the best uh, examples of a gate feature. We know that the irrigation system was extremely sophisticated and uh, uh, relied on the manipulation of the velocity of water at different places in the, in the system. And gates, internal gates, would have been important. And so they found a, uh, a lateral off of a main canal where there was uh, remains of a gate, also reservoirs. Uh, we know that the Hocom dug reservoirs for domestic water. Uh, but they uh, did a study, and they found that one of the reservoirs would probably only last five days. So you'd have to replenish your reservoirs if you wanted drinking water. Uh, but here's a reconstruction of the head gate, just to give you an idea of how sophisticated, again, these are. Uh, there were more than there were about 20 posts that were post holes that were posts, and it looks like most of it was a permanent structure and left open in the middle, that you and then supported by uh, oblique posts in the back, uh, three rows of posts, and the uh, the in, the middle was kept open so that you could put a uh, a piece of textile or a stone slab uh, to stop the flow of water when you didn't want it to flow in, and then pull it when you wanted it to flow in. Again. Uh, some of the engineering devices that the whole comet figured out to manipulate the flow of water. These are very rare features, so this was a really important discovery at La Ciudad. Uh, okay, Grand Canal Ruins, um, located to the north of La Ciudad. Uh, and uh, I want to talk just briefly about hornos, or earthen cooking ovens. Uh, the whole com uh, uh, understood the concept of barbecue well before we ever uh, were doing it. And they uh, dug uh, deep pits, some of them as deep as five feet. Uh, so you're talking big pits, uh, even as, big, as wide as 18 uh, feet wide. Huge pits that they filled with uh, heated stone and grasses and herbs, and then put either uh, 
agave hearts, as you can see in this example here, or choya bites, or small animals, and baked them for a day or two, and then had a delicious meal, and they reused these over and over and over again uh, till they have a black, thick grind. They're very dramatic looking feature, and they are large uh, enough that we assume that they're probably for larger than just single family uh, subsistence activities, but probably for feasts, uh, for ritual occasions and ceremonies that were being held in Hokam villages. Uh, also, Grand Canal ruins, we had uh, some examples of where the Hokam had captured Sonoran mud turtles and used their carapaces for ritual objects. And the Sonoran mud turtle is interesting because it, uh, it, it has a lot of ritual connotations, I believe. Uh, for one thing, it's, uh, it uh, hibernates for uh, cold weather, which means it buries itself in the mud and then comes out again. So the underground connotation, like, like lizards, is there. And then also it's a carnivore. And, and in addition, it mates in the water. So there's a water association. So again, I think we need to go beyond just looking at subsistence reasons for some of the animals that appear in the sites. They probably have much deeper meaning uh, involving rituals. Uh, okay, Casa Buena, which means pretty house or good house, uh, it was really important study because there was a cemetery that was found that had 57 individuals uh, inhumations. Uh, in other words, they were not cremated. Cremation was a typical Hokam burial method in the pre-classic period, but in the classic period after, uh, say, 1100, they added inhumations to it. So they continued with cremations, but there were more that were inhumations. And they provide a lot of information about Hokam health and uh, disease and also uh, social status. Uh, and there were four different distinct cemeteries, which we think were kinship groups. So it gave us a good idea about um, how uh, related individuals were buried in the same cemeteries associated with certain habitation. Uh, areas and some of the individual burials were very also informative. We learned uh, that adults typically live between 20 and 50 years, uh, although most adults were dead by 39 years. So it's a fairly short lifestyle, uh, which is not unusual for pre-industrial societies actually. Uh, and I suppose not surprisingly, those individuals that did live 50 or more years were females. So some things again, uh, yeah. You know, there's continuity uh, where the females, for some reason, have the capacity to live longer than the males do. Uh, there were children and infants and even one fetus that was found. 25% uh, uh, pre-adult uh, demographics, which is actually very typical for most Hokan villages. So it looks like it really does represent the burial population for that site, uh, which is very interesting that we actually would get that kind of sample uh, that provides information about um, their health and also their stature. The whole common male was typically five foot four inches. Uh, there's one individual as tall as five foot eight inches here. We have had other sites where we have found a few individuals up to six feet, but that's very rare. Most of them were around uh, five four or thereabouts, and the women were about five one. Um, so a very important study in that regard. And also the very goods, the males were, uh, buried with slightly more grave goods than the females, but the females typically had more vessels. And uh, it, with a few exceptions, there were no really rich people reflected in the burials, which made us realize that the Hokam probably had a somewhat egalitarian ethos. Uh, they were not a state society. They were not even a chiefdom level society, which has really been a big surprise to many archaeologists because we thought with these vast irrigation systems they had to be complex. But no, they had some mean to make everybody organize uh, and to get along and yet not at a very high level of complexity. It's one of the great mysteries of the Hokam uh, culture is how they're able to do that. Um, but there are some exceptions. For example, there was a young infant here, uh, only about a year and a half old, that had the richest grave assemblage of anyone. Uh, and uh, it's, um, it's on this one here. It's the one over, uh, uh, no, it's not here. Um, but you can see how they're laid out. 
in the inhumations with the grave goods typically around the heads, along the body, or at the feet. Uh, there's, you can see a lot of respect was paid to the dead by the Hokam. Obviously, uh, a, a deceased person was, was to be treated with the greatest respect, uh, much like archaeologists we continue to do. And it shows that the Hokam's concept of ancestors was very strong and uh, may have been a very important part of their uh, religious practices even. And Glenn Rice has actually written a really fascinating book about Hokam uh, burials and, and what, what it all means. Uh, but here's the child, uh, the infant, one to 1.5 years. And it had, for example, um, five vessels, a mono turquoise beads, a carved shell frog, nine shell bracelets, uh, shell rings, and a whole shell with a blue uh, pigment in it. And so that tells us that individual was not, uh, did not have a status that was achieved, like most uh, egalitarian uh, individuals would. It's ascribed. In other words, that child was a member of a family that had a higher status than other individuals. Otherwise, it would not have been afforded such rich burial offerings. So it does tell us there is some complexity still, uh, but it's not apparently uh, very pronounced, uh, although archaeologists will argue uh, over just how pronounced the complexity is. Uh, there was, um, oops. OK, and the last project I'm going to talk about Oh, no, one more thing. I don't want to forget this. Another thing about the Casa Buena uh, Cemetery told us is that the Hokam modified their skull shapes. Uh, it's called occipital modification, <coughs> cranial occipital modification. And uh, oh, there's a typo there. Uh, you can see what, it was, what a round-headed individual is, and you can see how they, they changed the shape of the head and it's found in 83% of the burials at this site. So it's very common. It's both male and female and children and infants. And probably when the, when the child was in the cradle board, they tied it to the cradle board so that the head would uh, form in a certain way. And that shape of the head would, had cultural significance uh, and, and may have been an, an identifier of the Hokam Although I will say that studies have shown that Sanawa and Mugion uh, cultures also had similar head uh, modification processes. Ancestral Pueblo up to, of the north also had uh, cranial modification, but they did it in a different way than the Mugion, the Sanawa, and the Hokam did. So clearly, there's an identity process that's involved in modifying the shape of your head as a child and then maintaining that form, of course, throughout your life. It's a very interesting form of identification. Uh, OK, the last slide I'm going to talk about is the Interstate 10 Las Colinas, which is the hills or the knolls. Uh, this uh, project was also a large project uh, where they excavated over 150 houses, a ball court again. And the platform mound is a very important study of the platform mound. Uh, David Gregory showed that the platform mound actually started small and expanded in seven different stages. And it was first constructed when the ball court was abandoned. So clearly there's a transition there between ball courts and platform mounds that relates to probably something to do with uh, changes in social organization and certainly changes in their religious practices. Uh, but they also excavated a large number of, of other features and they retrieved a million artifacts in this small excavation. Imagine sorting and cataloging a million artifacts from just one single project. This is the scale of archaeology that uh, occurs in Hocom all the time. It's huge. The amount of data that we're collecting is hard for any one archaeologist to, to actually know it all and handle on it all. And it's a good thing, uh, but it'll keep you reading reports all of your life. Uh, uh, and then one last thing I want to say about Interstate uh, 10, Las Colinas, two more things. One is uh, there were 11 incised pallets. Incised pallets are actually uh, pre-classic period. They're from the century period. They're typically with cremations. And there are some of us that uh, are looking at Hokam religion uh, because we think we can actually say some interesting things about Hokam religion. And the pallets were clearly a ritual object, buried with the cremations, probably went through the cremation fire. And in fact, 
Uh, they're, ha they, they're often incised, and I would argue the incisions represent rattlesnakes. And rattlesnakes, again, would be an underground uh, creature represented with the underworld, which is where the dead go. When you die, you go into the underground. It's a very common concept among <clears throat> many pre-industrial societies. So it's not surprising that you have designs that look like the rattlesnake designs. But what's even more interesting is that they're rectangular, uh, usually, and uh, they have a lead oxide that's been highly burnt on the interior of them, uh, which means that there was probably galena or some other form of lead that was put in the middle of it, and then that burned in the cremation fire. People have done studies, and they've shown that that lead, when it melts, turns a bright red-blue color. And in fact, uh, what I think is it's showing the doorway into the underworld for that deceased person who's been cremated to go into the underworld, and that doorway is a very dramatic uh, opening uh, through the burning of the lead oxides uh, in, within the palate itself. And one last thing is uh, Las Colinas had a really interesting collection of ceramic vessels that were from the uh, Colorado River and Lower Gila River of a different people, uh, the Patayan people who very likely spoke an entirely different language, a human language, uh, and their culture was quite uh, distinct from the Hocom, and yet there's a portion of Las Colinas on the west edge where there are houses that are full of these vessels, and it looks like it's an enclave of another culture living on the edge of the site, and uh, it could well be uh, that these individuals were providing labor uh, to assist in the canal construction and maintenance system, or as Glenn has actually argued, they may be recruited so that Las Colinas, which is at the end of the canal system, if ever Pueblo Grande decided to shut the water off, Las Colinas had lots of people that they could marshal up and march down to Pueblo Grande and say, don't do that. <laughs> uh, and it's an interesting idea that you would recruit immigrants to help with labor and then also to serve uh, maybe some military capacity to ensure that you got water because the Salt River uh, had floods, it had droughts throughout the year. We have really good records now through looking at uh, um, tree rings uh, from the watershed. We know that the river never was the same any one year uh, and from decade to decade. And there were times where the water was low and there would have been a stress on making sure that everybody got water. So it's an interesting idea that the that this big village at the end uh, said, well, we're gonna ensure that we always get water. So that's just some of the highlights I wanted to give you to show you what we can learn from, from sites under the freeway. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And I guess we'll open it up to questions. Oh boy, okay. Here, in the back. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, you're saying this is the Colorado River area? Yes, or Lower Gila River. Is there, are they larger? Because to me, Colorado people are pretty big and broad. Interestingly, they are, they have a larger statue than the Hocom do, yes. Yes, it's true. She was asking where the, yeah, the question was, did the, uh, the, the Lower Colorado River battalion, were they bigger people? And yes, some of the evidence suggests they have a lot stature, just like if you compared the Navajo to the Hopi today. The Navajo are much bigger people than the Hopi, uh, and so some, clearly some cultures, the males were bigger for some reason. Yes, I think that. Uh, yes, I, I talked about there were three reservoirs found uh, at Las, uh, La Ciudad that were for domestic purposes. There's been other sites where that's been found, but I will say at Las Colinas they found a big reservoir, and they found through study of the stratigraphy that it wasn't the water thereafter. They wanted the clay deposits that the water deposited to use the clay for making ceramic objects. So it was essentially a process of making clay for your ceramics. So the reservoirs might have had multiple purposes actually, and that would make sense. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'll you in a minute. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, the examples I've seen uh, is just children, and uh, it was usually by their side. Yeah. The question was, were uh, uh, dogs buried with children or adults? And what I know is it's been primarily children. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, the Salt River was a perennial river before the, all the dams got built. The Gila River was a perennial river before dams were built on it. Those were the two major rivers here. Now, there are tributaries that had river that had flowing water seasonally. Um, Agua Fria, Verde River had permanent water. So I could say there might have been four rivers that had were flowing year-round. Yes, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Well, it'd be before uh, they built Roosevelt Dam in 1911, yeah, which was to control the river because the river was too wild for the pioneers, which is, if you think about that, that's amazing. The Holcomb did not have the capacity to build dams. They built weirs that just raised the water up into the canals. <coughs> and so for us people to be able to live here, we had to build dams. The Holcomb figured out how to do it without building dams. So in some ways, they were smarter than we are. Yes. Back to dogs, did they um, find the protein was a little low? Did they eat we have no evidence of dogs being eaten in, in, in the Hocom area, unlike down in Mesoamerica, where the, royal, the royalty ate dogs. No, I, I've looked at that, and I haven't found any evidence of dogs being eaten. They were trusty friends and, and workers. Yes. It was Casa Buena, but also Grand Canal and other sites too. I don't like to use the word deformation. I know that's a term you see written because that sort of implies it's deformed, but it's intentional and it's modification and it's what they thought was to make a person more attractive. So. Uh, I'm not sure what the others, but it, it is present in, in many sites, yeah. It was a common trait, yeah. As, as it was in other cultures, too, in the Southwest. Yes. Were the dogs of the regular children their pets? Their father killed when the child died? And also, what is your theory about the platform mounds and their purpose? Dogs. I didn't realize people would be so interested <laughs> in dogs. But you know, we all love dogs. Uh, so it's not surprising. Uh, the dogs. Um, Yeah, you know, unfortunately, we don't have that many examples. But I will say this. At Pueblo Grande, when the WPA did some work in the 1930s, uh, I wrote up a chapter on that excavations from a trash mound with, uh, with uh, Steve James, who's a, 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 a bone specialist. And we found that there were puppies. So they were raising dogs. I mean, they were raising them from puppies. So clearly, it was an important enough that they were caring for the puppies and feeding them so they would grow to an older age. So they clearly, well, they were important to them uh, in a way that was, uh, you know, merited uh, using their own food to ensure that they survived, the dog survived. We don't know that. We don't know that. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, yes or no, I don't know. Can't answer that. Platform mounts. Oh. Well, I've argued that platform mounts, and this is highly debated, uh, what were platform mounts used for? Um, there's an old theory that says platform mounds were where the really rich and famous lived because, you know, they wanted to have a penthouse. So they built an earthen mound that, you know, maybe 10 feet or taller. And, but when you look at the amount of earth and stone that goes in that, that's a lot of work just so you can say you got the penthouse. <clears throat> I think they were ritual. I think they were <clears throat> utilized for, uh, by priests for different uh, activities. And then, you know, they started small circular in the pre-classic, and then they became square in the classic, small, and then they got really big later in the classic, rectangular. So there's an evolution there. What's interesting is at the very late stage where they're big rectangular, uh, after a while they started building a lot of dwellings on top. And so that's why people say, aha, that must be the rich and famous people. But I can tell you, Pueblo Grande, uh, the burials that are on the platform mount are some of the poorest burials in the entire site. 
and there's been uh, around 2,000 burials that have been excavated at Pueblo Grande now. So if you're so uh, rich and famous, why are the burials on the mound so poor? Uh, again, I think it's part of that egalitarian ethos. Now, it doesn't mean the people up there weren't powerful. They probably were, and that's why they were up there. But the question is, you know, was it a chiefdom? No, we don't believe that chiefdoms existed uh, for the whole com. But clearly, there's something going on in the platform mound that relates to authority, administration of some activities, and then also there's a lot of ritual artifacts that have been found, especially at Pueblo Grande, that indicates there were ceremonies that were going on. And in fact, on the whole uh, west side of the platform on at Pueblo Grande, there's all these bins that look like they were full of a large amount of corn. And that corn would have been used in feasting activities that the leaders of the platform mound were coordinating the feast. So their power may not be in control of the whole village, but in actually coordinating ceremonies that were important to the whole village. So it's pretty complex. Glenn and I have had a lot of debates about this, and he has some interesting ideas too. So the platform mounds are a very interesting component of, and we know that there were, uh, they were spaced usually about uh, three miles apart on the canal system. So clearly, you just didn't build one because you wanted to build one. It's, it's got an administrative function uh, because of his spacing on the system. So, yeah. Yes. I was going to ask if you got a guess based on the number of uh, sites you've been able to excavate. What kind of square mileage are we talking about? You know, people come up with all kinds of square kilometers, and uh, I'm not even going to throw it out because we debate it. But I will say this uh, there is some pretty good data that probably in the Salt River Valley area, including the Hill River, there was more than 20,000 Holcomb living at one time. So it's one of the largest prehistoric populations in North America is here in this area. Some people said even more, but I think that's, that's a figure that's probably most of us could accept, at least 20,000 people, which is a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they, uh, they had a native tobacco that they, that they utilized. And I will tell you, the native tobacco is not a recreational herb, by the way. It'll, it'll knock you off your socks and probably uh, maybe even give you hallucinogenics. It was a very powerful ritual uh, material, not smoked for recreation purposes, as well as some other uh, plants that they use probably for hallucinogenic reasons, uh, such as jimson weed or datura. Uh, we find that uh, present not only uh, remain to the plant, but also we find vessels that are shaped like the pods that, that grow on those plants. Uh, so we know the Hokam very likely, like every prehistoric culture, had hallucinogenics probably used during rituals, ceremonial activities, for visions. Because we're pretty clear that trances and visions were part of, of the ritual process by uh, religious specials, as it is for all pre-industrial societies. Um, ball courts, um, yes, there have been balls found, uh, a small number. Uh, the last count that I had was, uh, was three or four. What are they made out of? Well, uh, they're made, the one at Pueblo Grande was found was made out of stone, which I can't imagine. Uh, if you're playing the game, you know, a hip game, and you're bouncing it off your body in stone, that's going to be pretty deadly. Uh, but, but there are ones that are, that are rubber. Uh, just like the ones down in Mesoamerica, and they're made out of a plant called guayuli plant, which is actually a very poor rubber, but it is rubber. But I can tell you that uh, that's kind of a misnomer, uh, that that wasn't a dangerous game, because many people uh, are recorded to be severely hurt and even killed in the ball games of Mesoamerica with the rubber balls, because it's a really hard rubber ball, and they're usually this big. Also, I'd like to point out, we did a study, and I have a talk that I've given and will continue to give, where I really looked at the, what we know about ball courts in Mesoamerica. There's three kinds of games. They're not just a hit ball that we often think about. There's two other versions. There's one is a handball game, and there's another one that's a stickball game. All three of them are still uh, practiced in Mesoamerica today. And so we need to be careful to say that the Hocom had a hit ball game uh, as the Aztec did and where our best uh, uh, records are accounted from, 
because it could have been a stickball game or it could have been a handball game as well. Or all three even, because we now believe that at, at some sites like Tewa Tewa Khan, which is the massive site that controlled most of Mesoamerica for a period of time, it looks like all three games were played there. So, um, but clearly it's a ball game. I, I'm, I'm convinced it is a ball game, a whole com game. One yeah, more one question. Uh-oh. I, I got four hands here and I got one question. Okay, let me ask this gentleman here. No, I don't believe that you'll find any hope. Well, there's always a few, but I, most Holcom archaeologists are not going to support the state society. Uh, but what's clearly going on is there's more insularity that's occurring. Because the ball court had markets. You could, a lot of people could come. It was open. But to go actually to the top of the platform mound, you had to be a select few that got invited there. The compound wall at Pueblo Grande is nine feet tall. You couldn't even see what's going on up there. So something has changed where certain ceremonies and rituals are no longer available to the public. And that's really profound change, but I don't think it's state level society. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a lot more to defining what a state level society is, and so it's a more complex. But let me just end, because you made a good point here, the talk with a comment that, so what happened to the Holcom? You know, they were sustainable for a thousand years, and then there's a major collapse. There's no question that the collapse occurred. When it occurred, we're not sure. We used to think it was early 1400s. Now we're pushing it into the 1350s or so when there were a series of major floods, really big floods. But we don't think the floods were the sole reason. If you ask an Atom who's familiar with their oral traditions, they will tell you, and it's been reported, that the people that were on controlling the platform mounds had become evil. And so there was a revolt. The common people said, that's it, we don't want you of our leaders anymore. And there were battles that took place. And through those battles, the common people won, and then the society collapsed as a result of the, of the uh, decline of the, of the leaders. Um, so, you know, how that fits into your model, you know, probably we could talk about that more later. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, I appreciate it.